Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. We welcome you to uh, another session of our almost weekly events. And uh, today we are honored to have uh, uh, Dr. Michael Wallace, uh, who will be talking on artificial intelligence and in, uh, gastroenterology. Uh, Dr. Christopher Kaur from Singapore and Dr. Mahesh Goenka is here as well, who needs no introduction. But before we start the introductions, I'm just going to play a little video as I promised the Olympus team, we'll, we'll play this video. So I'm going to share my screen for a second. Give me a second. All right. So yeah, there we go. Uh, I guess it should be visible now. All right. I guess the scopes keep getting better and better. So, all right, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are honored to have Dr. Michael Wallace uh, from Abu Dhabi joining us today. Uh, Dr. Wallace is the Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Abu Dhabi at uh, Sheikh Shagbooth Medical City. Uh, he received his uh, medical degree from Duke. He completed his uh, residency and fellowship at Brigham at Harvard and uh, advanced endoscopy fellowship at the MUSC with Dr. Peter Cotton and Robert Hawes. Uh, Michael, uh, uh, he joined Mayo Clinic in 2003 and was promoted to full professor in 2007 and chair of the division in 2010. He served multiple roles for the AGA, ASG, and ACG, including associate editor for gastroenterology. He currently chairs the World Endoscopy Organization Committee on Artificial Intelligence. He's been the editor-in-chief of the peer-reviewed medical journal Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, which all the endoscopists all over the world follow routinely. So... Uh, he's the Chair of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at uh, the UAE Mayo Clinic since uh, six months now. Uh, his research focuses on advanced endoscopic imaging and therapies for GI cancer, including artificial intelligence tools to detect early colorectal and pancreas cancer. He holds multiple active NIH grants uh, in advanced imaging of early neoplasia. He's published more than 350 peer-reviewed manuscripts and more than 300 books uh, book chapters, review articles, and editorials. And he's been mentor, he's mentored more than 50 gastroenterology and research fellows and received the National Mentor of the Year Award from both the ASG and AGA and Teacher of the Year Awards from Mayo Clinic. So thank you, Michael, for joining today. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Christopher Kaur, who is joining us from Singapore. Uh, Dr. Kaur is a um, clinical associate professor at the Duke and U.S. Medical School. And um, his main practice areas are in pancreatobiliary endoscopy, endoscopic resection, and general gastroenterology. He has a keen interest in endoscopic quality and education. He, uh, he led the project team that uh, built uh, his hospital's new ambulatory endoscopy center. He's the, he was the chief of the gastroenterology division at Singapore General Hospital from 2015 to 2018. Uh, he co-chairs an Asia Pacific group focused on US education as well as uh, was the vice president of the APDW 2011 in Singapore. Uh, he's the immediate past chairman of the chapter of gastroenterologists Academy of Medicine, Singapore, and is a past president of the Gastroenterology Society of Singapore. So thank you, Chris, for joining today. And uh, we also have Dr. Mahesh Goenka, uh, who needs uh, no introduction for the Indian audience. He um, is uh, a gastroenterologist at the Apollo Hospital in Calcutta. He served uh, seven years as a faculty at uh, PGI prior to his, uh, after his training at PGI. Uh, he's awarded International Leadership Award uh, 2020 by the ACG. 
He's the governor for ACG in the India region. He's the president elect of the Indian Society of Gastroenterology. And he's also appointed as clinical professor of medicine at the University of Wisconsin from 2018 to 2023. And he's published more than 200 scientific papers. And I understand he's also very keen and interested in artificial intelligence. So um, we look forward to discussing things with all of you. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. So I'll, uh, let, uh, I'll hand over the proceedings to uh, Michael for going ahead with the talk. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you for the, uh, the very kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to uh, be with you all this evening uh, from here in Abu Dhabi, not, uh, not too far away, just a couple of hours away. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here uh, and just confirm uh, in just a second here that you can see my slides. Let's go ahead and get the slideshow up. So hopefully, let's see. You see the full slide display now? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. Well, again, uh, we're going to talk for the next 45 minutes or so about some of the really rapidly uh, evolving um, tools uh, in, in artificial intelligence and endoscopy. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the other cross-sectional applications such as pancreas cancer detection and, and uh, pancreatic cyst uh, classification um, systems. Uh, these are my disclosures here. So first of all, let, let me begin with just some of the terminology. We've all been hearing about AI and machine learning over the last uh, five to 10 years, but uh, just to get us all on the same page, I wanna make sure we understand what these terms mean. So. Um, what we mostly are dealing with in the field of gastroenterology is the technique called computer vision. So computer vision is a technology that allows computers to, quote, see and interpret visual content. Very relevant to what we do as endoscopists, uh, whether it's looking at an endoscopic image or, or even a CT or MRI scan. Uh, but backing up, the field of the, the term artificial intelligence is a very broad term. It's been around actually uh, since the 1940s and 50s. Uh, basically, these are computer systems that are able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, things like visual perception or computer vision, but also include things like speech recognition and decision making, which are all also relevant to some aspects of endoscopy. Machine learning is really the process. Machine learning is the, are the applications of artificial intelligence that provide systems the ability to automatically learn and improve from experience without being explicitly programmed. And this is how it differs from standard computer programming. Um, so these, uh, the, the, the code uh, uh, evolves and learns as it goes. And a subset of machine learning is something called deep learning. Um, it, uh, it relies on networks capable of learning unsupervised. And unsupervised is really critical um, because uh, all previous techniques required you to label um, for example, if you want to distinguish different types of polyps, a human had to say this is an adenoma and this is a hyperplastic and this is a cancer. In deep learning, the algorithms uh, learn to detect unlabeled data and distinguish differences between them. And that is very important for um, how we train these algorithms. Um, it makes the training process much more efficient and much faster. Let's see. Sorry, my... There we go. So when we talk about the types of AI and their GI applications, I'm really going to focus tonight on computer vision um, and what's called computer-aided detection, um, often abbreviated CAD-E, and computer-aided classification, abbreviated typically CAD-X for diagnosis. Uh, we'll also touch base on some radiographical image detection and classification systems. I will not uh, talk about two other relevant areas, which is automatic report generation. For example, can we train systems to just generate the report as we go to describe the polyp, its size, its shape, and how we removed it? And the answer to that is a definite yes, these systems are already in place. And lastly, can we take some of the work burden off of quality metrics? Uh, can we train these systems to uh, simple things, but these take a fair amount of time for us to do? Uh, excuse me, hopefully that internet connection will stay up. So what, what really changed about 10 years ago in AI that really made it so applicable in so many different areas from driving, self-driving cars to facial recognition on your social media app to endoscopy. So in the old days, I would say, particularly from about 1950 up until about 10 years ago, 
Now we used what's called rules-based learning. What we tried to do is train these algorithms to think as we thought humans thought. Um, I use that word carefully. Uh, we, when we try to describe something, uh, we might give it uh, certain labels. If we're trying to distinguish a cat and a dog, we might say a cat has four legs, a tail, pointed ears, and a flat nose. And a dog might have four legs, a tail, and floppy ears, or a pr protruding nose, much like you might say that the kudo classification of polyps has a, you know, a kudo class one has small round pits, and kudo class two has stellate. Um, and we all know from that experience that, that doesn't work particularly well. Uh, it's, it's difficult to get the high reproducibility. Accuracy is at best uh, modest in expert hands. Um, but when we label things, we're not actually doing what our brain does. When our brain looks at a cat and a dog, it immediately recognizes some difference between these and, and recognizes the difference between these two animals. It does not go through the logical step of, does it have four legs? Does it have a tail? Does it have a flat nose versus a protruding nose? Um, those are artificial labels that we put on these, uh, much like we put artificial labels like Kudo classification or Paris classification or JNET classification on polyps. And as a result, when we try to label things, um, uh, they, it doesn't work as well. So what's really happened with AI is the so-called, at least the initial step was so-called supervised learning. So basically you would label a large number of images, in this case, all cats on one side and all dogs on the other, and feed these into a machine learning algorithm and say, recognize somehow the difference between these two. And most recently, with machine learning and particularly deep learning was the ability to do unsupervised learning where you didn't even have to label the difference. You just put in all of these pictures and allowed the system to distinguish and segregate uh, um, one set of images from the other. A number of both hardware and software technologies have also uh, rapidly enabled the modern AI re uh, revolution. One of these probably most importantly is a different type of graphics processor. Um, uh, it's not, uh, th this processor, the so-called NVIDIA graphics processor did not come out of a concerted effort to come up with an AI uh, a processor. This actually came out of the gaming industry and the gaming industry was driven for very, very rapid video image processing. It turned out that that rapid video processing was ideally suited for computer vision technology. And so this really combined with these tool, tools of machine learning and deep learning allowed for processing of very, very large sets of images such as a colonoscopy video that as we know has uh, 30, 60 uh, frames per second over several minutes. You get thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of images. And on the software side, multiple software systems, Python, Python MATLAB, Google AI are all tools that are available in the public domain. Uh, most uh, people are using these systems on cloud servers. They're available for all of us to use. Um, an important milestone really came out of a, an experiment at Caltech by a very young, uh, at the time a PhD student, uh, Fei-Fei Li. Um, when she was a graduate student at Caltech, she decided to develop an image competition that she called ImageNet. And uh, she provided a large set of standard images, very simple things like cats and dogs and stoplights and stop signs, and asked people to see who could develop the most accurate processing uh, computer vision and deep learning um, tools. And from 2011 to 2015, there were a series of competitions that increasingly got closer and closer to human level uh, accuracy. And it was really between about 2015 and 16 that these algorithms started to surpass human accuracy and human speed. And since then, we all know that these systems can very rapidly process images, whether you're just using facial recognition on your standard camera or self-driving cars that have to recognize stoplights and stop signs and pedestrians crossing the street. But it was really a very recent phenomenon, just about five uh, years ago, that these tools became uh, fast enough where they were at least uh, as quick as humans and now in many cases uh, quicker and sometimes more accurate. The first medical applications of this that really came into widespread uh, recognition again was just about four years ago. This was a landmark paper in the journal Nature, the most prominent journal in all of science. 
And the reason it got published in Nature was it was a very well done experiment looking at skin lesions. So much like we look at polyps and try to say this is a benign polyp, hyperplastic, serrated adenoma, cancer, uh, dermatologists have to make a distinction between uh, a benign seborrheic keratosis, a nevus, a basal cell carcinoma, or squamous cell, and they do that based on looking at it and classifying, it, just like we have Paris and Kudo classifications. In this case, they used 25 expert dermatologists as the reference standard and then trained the algorithm to see how it performed relative to these expert uh, dermatologists. And as you can see in the right-hand side here, we have the classic receiver operating characteristic that plots the sensitivity and specificity as you change the threshold of the algorithm. And a perfect test should have a uh, a very high sensitivity and specificity, essentially reaching this upper right corner of this ROC curve, which would be a perfect 100% sensitivity and specificity. And the dermatologists are each shown as small red dots here. And you can see that the algorithm essentially performed as well or better than all 25 uh, dermatologists at uh, making a diagnosis of cancer versus non-cancer or melanoma versus non-melanoma lesions. So this was really a breakthrough moment for the field of AI and computer vision. In gastroenterology, we have similar issues. We're trying to both detect polyps and classify polyps. And here's just some examples of both the CAD-E and CAD-X uh, system. In the, in, in the top screen showing a standard white light image um, and in the bottom screen showing the uh, endobrain um, system and an endocytoscope very, very high magnification um, image. So um, here's another system. And I'll say, first of all, that pretty much all of these systems work in a similar way. And if we look at this picture here, uh, we all recognize uh, the colon. And I think uh, you can start to recognize uh, that maybe there's a flat polyp in this area, a very flat, subtle polyp, in fact. Um, and you can see that uh, this technology, all of these systems work fairly similarly. They use a so-called bounding box, these green boxes, and it works in real time. So it's processing this image as we're doing the colonoscopy. It's uh, telling the endoscopist to look here, here's something of interest. Now, ultimately these are just aids. The endoscopist still has to make a final decision to decide, is this truly a polyp? And if so, uh, how you would manage it. Uh, these are so-called CAD-E or detection systems. Here's another uh, example of this on the left-hand side, detecting a subtle serrated polyp in the right colon, right behind a fold. And you can see that these systems seem to accurately detect uh, even difficult polyps. Again, here, a sessile serrated polyp sitting right next to a fold. Uh, I think all of us as endoscopists would uh, recognize the challenge uh, of, rec of uh, seeing that lesion. And even more so in distinguishing it from uh, false uh, or artifacts. Here we've got a small serrated polyp in the midst of some bubbles and mucus, a common situation. And yet the AI systems are recognizing that there is in fact uh, a serrated polyp here in the midst of all these bubbles. And so uh, they do perform surprisingly well, um, even in these challenging situations. In uh, the scientific literature, we've just seen an explosion. We really saw beginning in about the uh, beginning of 2020 uh, to the present, uh, this has been the single hottest topic uh, in the field of, of endoscopy, uh, really at all of the major journals. Uh, um, uh, uh, only a close second is some of the lumen opposing metal stent a first major clinical trial, a first really randomized controlled tr clinical trial of an AI system uh, used for colonoscopy and polyp detection. It came out of China uh, with several uh, collaborators in the U.S., um, uh, Dr. Pu Wang from China, Dr. Tyler Burzin from Boston, uh, and many others. So this was a well-done randomized controlled trial, very robust, robust over a thousand patients, randomized to either standard colonoscopy or CAD-E assisted colonoscopy. And what you can see overall is that the polyp detection rate here, 29% versus 45%, the adenoma detection rate, 20% versus 29%, mean number of polyps, mean number of adenomas, all showed superiority with the CAD-E system. Uh, this is a, a trial that we were involved with uh, from Alessandro Repici and Ch uh, Cesare Hassan, another randomized controlled trial 
uh, now uh, just recently published in gastroenterology, randomizing 700 patients uh, to similar CAD-E or standard colonoscopy. And overall, what uh, we found is that there was an increased adenoma detection rate from 41% to 57% overall. And that was true across the spectrum of small, medium, and larger polyps. It was true for polypoid as well as non-polypoid. And it was true in the right colon as well as the left colon. So overall, robust findings, again, showing improved polyp detection with CAD systems. We now have multiple studies. At the time of this trial, uh, this meta-analysis in 2020, there were six randomized controlled trials of CAD systems for adenoma detection. And this has really been one of the more remarkably consistent fields in endoscopy. We have all six trials positive, all six in the same direction in terms of improved adenoma detection rate, with about a 1.47 relative uh, risk ratio uh, for, for finding an adenoma. So roughly a 47% increase in the relative adenoma detection with CAD-E system. So again, very robust, very reproducible um, findings that show that CAD systems increase adenoma detection rate. Notably, they increase, and if we go back to this last slide, they increase from even a high baseline. Notice the, the standard adenoma detection rate in this trial was 41%, remarkably high, and it increased it even among expert endoscopists to 57%. So we've not seen that in, in many other studies. Often you reach a sort of a maximum threshold value above which other technologies have not improved us further. Um, whereas this system really does seem to improve. Um, what about CAD-X? So we've seen now uh, multiple studies. This is a fairly recent one from, uh, from GIE uh, looking at the polyp classification. So this is just using standard white light and narrowband imaging uh, systems and shows that uh, we can make this diagnosis relatively accurately with CAD, uh, syst uh, CAD X system. So uh, in this case, uh, we have um, uh, multiple uh, polyps here, uh, looking at either all polyps, small polyps, uh, very small polyps, and overall very high sensitivity and specificity. These meet all of the standard threshold values, the so-called PIVI values, for using an optical biopsy type system. What's remarkable about this, and, and uh, you know, we've been looking at technologies to achieve this goal for really 20, 25 years. I started doing chromoendoscopy 25 years ago uh, when I was a GI fellow. Um, and we, we had improvements with uh, narrowband imaging and other similar systems, but this system does not require an expert. Um, and it, it, as such, it's much more reproducible uh, it's accurate across whoever's using it for the most part. I mean, it takes, so it takes away a lot of those challenges that we've seen for two decades. The experts do really well, but when you put it in practice, it didn't do as well. Now you can essentially put the expert in a box in your room um, and have it available to you all the time. Let's now turn to a couple of other AI applications in GI. There's actually many. I've just shown a couple of uh, them here. Uh, one very obvious is wireless capsule endoscopes, um, endomicroscopy tools. We saw the uh, endocytoscope earlier, um, but uh, uh, really all of the endomicroscopy tools, whether it's uh, VLE or confocal or endocytoscopy, can all be standardized using uh, CAD-E and CAD-X systems. It also extends to physiologic devices. Actually, some of the uh, most significant advances early on were simply an EKG. So there's been remarkable uh, advances. In fact, EKGs, you can now train an EKG to recognize whether the person is a male or a female. You can determine their age, you can determine their potassium level. Um, so it, it really does extend to other things that might not be as obvious to us as endoscopists. You, so you can train it to read a manometry, read a pH capsule, read an endoflip um, uh, technology. Um, let me focus a little bit on capsules because I think this is really one of the most important uh, applications. All of us, when confronted with eight hours of capsule video and trying to find a small arteriovenous malformation in the midst of eight hours of video, now that's a daunting task and, and we don't do particularly well with it. We know that often the relevant images may only be about 10 or 20 seconds worth of, worth of that eight hours 
of video. So can we train these systems to detect those relevant lesions? This is really a perfect situation for AI. And the answer to that is yes. This is again, a very, very large study um, out, of, uh, uh, out of China published in 2019. Uh, they developed a training set of a, a very a massive number of images, 158,000 plus images, and then validated that on uh, 5,000 conventional reading images and 5,000 of the same images read by a convolutional neural network or, or AI system. Eventually reading a consensus, uh, which was made up of uh, consensus of 20 expert readers. So first of all, in terms of accuracy, the AI or convolutional neural network system uh, was essentially perfect. It, uh, it achieved an accuracy 99.9% .9 sensitivity and 100% specificity compared to conventional reading. So conventional reading is one expert endoscopist or capsule reader uh, looking at that. And we all know that we miss some lesions. Uh, it's not surprising in those eight hours of video that we miss a couple of lesions. Um, uh, so overall, the, uh, the reading system, the CNN or AI system was significantly more accurate than a conventional reader. This was actually true across a broad spectrum of lesions, including inflammatory lesions, ulcers, polyps, vascular lesions, bleeding, uh, lymphangiectasias. So it's quite robust. Uh, and this is true of capsule in general. We know that there's a broad range of lesions and that presents some challenges to train any uh, a convolutional neural network or AI system to detect such a broad range of lesions. What was really nice about it and really the ultimate goal was it was significantly more efficient. So we know that the number of images on a standard capsule exceeds 20,000, whereas the CNN system, the AI system, was able to reduce that dramatically to less than 100 relevant images. So even there, you could just show those to the endoscopist and have them look at those selected Im images. However, it, it went a step further. It asked the system to automatically detect and classify those relevant lesions. So using such a system, they were able to reduce their read time down from just under 100 minutes to just under six minutes. So who wouldn't want that? You have a system that's more accurate, faster. Um, so I think any one of us uh, would like such a system in our endoscopy unit. Let me now turn in the second half of the talk to uh, non-endoscopic imaging. So we all, uh, as therapeutic endoscopists, especially if you do EOS or ERCP, deal with pancreas cancer. And in particular, uh, we deal with advanced pancreas cancer, and we know that the prognosis of that is very poor. Uh, we know that uh, most patients um, uh, in, the, in the Western world present with metastatic or at least uh, regionally locally advanced pancreas cancer with over half of individuals presenting with metastatic disease. And we know that to achieve any significant hope of survival, you really have to pick it up at that localized stage. So how can we use these AI tools to, to help us improve early detection of pancreas cancer? Well, uh, it's a tough challenge because pancreas cancer happens at a cellular level. This is the sort of standard uh, pancreatic, uh, 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 pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia going from low-grade dysplasia, pan in one and two, to high-grade dysplasia, pan in three, to cancer. And these are microscopic changes. These are less than a tenth of a millimeter in size. We know the uh, molecular events that underpin these. On the other hand, we have this window of opportunity. If we can develop a pan, if we can detect a pan in three where early stage cancer, we have the opportunity to cure those patients. And this process we know takes somewhere, for example, to go from pan and three to cancer, it's estimated from several studies that takes about seven years. So we have that window of opportunity, um, particularly in patients who are uh, being followed in surveillance programs, such as those with family histories or IPMN uh, or mucinous cystic neoplasms uh, where we're following them regularly. So, how can we, uh, how can we help use these tools to find these early cancers? So we know that even radiographic imaging has limited sensitivity. Uh, for example, you know, where we see this mass here, um, it's fairly obvious, although subtle, and some of these are missed. And we know from historical studies that uh, CTs uh, miss 
uh, these lesions, the sensitivity of a CT is only about 89, 90%, and probably much less than this for lesions less than two centimeters in size. We all have that experience of uh, looking at a tumor that's presenting to us now, and sometimes patients may have had a CT or MRI a, a year or so before, and we look back and say there was something subtle there. Uh, maybe we should have detected it back then when it was more curable. Um, so this is a, a, a series of several projects our group has been working on with several um, uh, scientists in the, uh, in the uh, AI field, uh, particularly Dr. Ulas Bagsi at the um, uh, uh, Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Central Florida. So we undertook the task of seeing if we could train AI algorithms to detect early pancreas cancer. Um, and it published a series of studies um, using archival CT and MRI uh, images in patients with well-defined uh, known IPMN in cancerous lesions. So the first experiment we did, um, which was published a couple of years ago, looked at how well we can classify IPMN. So we currently classify IPMN ba based on either the Fukuoka criteria or the AGA criteria. And so we took expert radiologists. These are people who are very well trained to read pancreas MRIs, and we had them classify them as either uh, low risk, worrisome, or high risk based on the Fukuoka criteria. And then we trained a AI algorithm to do the same. And what you see here is this solid line is the AI algorithm. The hatch lines are the expert radiologists using either of the AGA or Fukuoka criteria. And what you can see is that these lines essentially overlap, which means that the AI algorithm was as good in terms of as accurate as an expert radiologist. But again, the major difference is that read takes less than a second to do for an AI algorithm versus typically about 20 minutes to do for an expert radiologist. So this was a retrospective study. We're now in the midst of a very large NIH funded prospective study uh, looking at uh, the same uh, issue. So the other issue that we've tried to tackle is that phenomenon I described to you, you're in tumor board, you're looking at a pancreas tumor that's now locally advanced or metastatic, and a patient sometimes had a scan a year, two, three years ago, and we often go look at those and say, could we have detected this a year ago, two, three years ago? And we had a large set of these scans. Uh, we went back over about a decade and identified individuals who had cancer pre presenting now who had cross-sectional CT or MRI sometime within the last three years prior. Um, and so the goal of this study was to assess, first of all, the prevalence of missed pancreas cancer and other abnormalities in the three years prior to their clinical diagnosis, and to develop deep learning neural network systems that can identify these missed lesions. So we identified cases which were patients with index uh, pancreas cancer and who had CT imaging within three years, and controls were patients who uh, had CT imaging of the same type, same contrast, or MRI image of the same type, same contrast, who did not, not develop pancreas cancer over the same period of time. Um, it's important that when we presented these images to the radiologist for review, we presented cases and controls in a blinded way. So they didn't know if they were reading a CT of a patient that in two years time would go on to get cancer, or in two years time would not go on to get cancer. So that's important from a study design standpoint of view. So to do this, we identified about 600 patients who had uh, been diagnosed at our facility with uh, pancreas cancer. And of those, about 60 had um, CT imaging within three years of their diagnosis. We then matched them for controls based on age, gender, the time of the image, and the type of image they had. So we had about 60 cases and about 200 35 controls. And what we found is that the, um, uh, what was really remarkable is that in the cases, about 50%, about half of them, the radiologist said they could actually identify a significant abnormality in the previous image that was not apparent. So that's important. Just a careful review and a good quality radiologist can identify these, about half of these cases. But importantly, the controls, they only 1%, they said there's something significant here. So they're not just overcalling it, knowing um, that something uh, would happen at a future date. Um, what they saw, the distribution of findings uh, typically were pancreatic ductal dilatation, pancreatic duct disruption, and typically upstream 
pancreatic atrophy. So those are the key features uh, that are often missed by radiologists. So this is sort of best radiologists. They're picking up about 50% incremental yield. I'm just uh, uh, showing this to an expert radiologist. So humans can detect about half of these so-called missed cases. Can we train an AI algorithm to do this? Because we don't always have our best radiologist reading uh, a scan every day, particularly if it's in the emergency department for some other reason, or they're in the urology department looking for a kidney uh, cyst. You're not going to have that expert pancreas radiologist all the time. So again, we took these same cases. We trained an AI algorithm on a subset of these images, now 20 cases and about 164 controls. Um, and we uh, developed uh, two, uh, two classifiers using some of the commonly available um, AI tool called AlexNet and ResNest. Um, and then we, uh, we basically asked it to say, is there something suspicious for cancer or not? And what we found uh, is that the overall, um, and I hesitate to use the word sensitivity because uh, remember, these are all CTs where the original reading did not report a finding. So this is really the incremental yield. So different models here found about a third overall of these images could be detected, the, the missed lesion could be detected by a simple uh, convolutional neural network. Now specificity was variable, but our best model overall had about uh, an incremental yield of about a third of cases with a reasonably good specificity. So that means an image, a CT image that the radiologist uh, missed the cancer, the AI algorithm detected something in about a third of those cases. So there is some potential here. So overall, this network, the so-called deep learning uh, neural network, um, detected between 27 and 34% of missed cancers with a reasonably good specificity, especially uh, the one algorithm reaching 84%. So overall, I think uh, there's some promise here. There's certainly more work to be done. Um, but the bottom line is uh, I think we're moving in a direction where we could potentially put these software systems into, uh, uh, into our, uh, our CT and MRI scanners to assist the radiologist, especially uh, uh, where you don't have the expert radiology message all the time. So the take home message from this study was that we have a window of opportunity to improve early pancreas cancer detection. Um, uh, there is some incremental yield. Uh, expert uh, radiologist review picks up about half of these. Uh, machines or, or AI systems pick up about a third of them. Ultimately, uh, we hope this will be a supplement uh, to assist expert radiologists, especially uh, if it's your uh, standard emergency department radiologist, it'll flag these much like you, you saw with the colonoscopy. Now, I want to conclude with uh, what I think is sort of the ultimate AI tool. So uh, what we really need are systems that are widely available, inexpensive, non-invasive, and well-tolerated. And it turns out that all of us have this system in our own home. Uh, we have it in our workplace. Uh, it's something that monitors our, our uh, gastrointestinal tract all the time for changes of inflammation, changes in the microbiome, and changes of cancer. And that's the toilet seat. So if you think about how much data we literally flush down the toilet every day, we know that you can detect colon cancer looking at uh, uh, altered methylation in your stool. We have increasing evidence that you can do that uh, for esophageal cancer. Even pancreas cancer, we now have emerging data that those exfoliated pancreas cancer cells or bile duct cancer cells eventually are detectable in a stool assay. So we can imagine uh, a, a time not too far from now where we're constantly monitoring our biological functions uh, just through uh, going to the restroom every day. It gives us feedback as to whether we might have an early cancer, maybe a change in our microbiome, maybe C. difficile or other relevant functions. So to summarize overall, I, I'd like to say that AI is rapidly transforming medicine. GI has really been a leader in this with now FDA and CE mark approved applications, such as the ones I showed you here today. And computer vision will, uh, is and will be our first application. Currently, we have multiple approved systems for lesion detection. Classification is soon to follow. 
Uh, we already have seen robust data on how these improve quality, such as adenoma detection rate, and also automatic report generation. I want to just uh, say thank you all. This is a slide from the nearby desert here uh, in Abu Dhabi, a photograph I took a couple of months ago when in the, the temperature was still a bit manageable. Uh, here, uh, it's uh, not quite uh, manageable now as we're approaching 45 and even 50 degrees centigrade uh, in the desert. Uh, here, uh, again, just for those of you who are geographically challenged like myself, Abu Dhabi is right here uh, on the, the uh, Arabian or Persian Gulf, uh, right next to Saudi Arabia. It's a beautiful modern city and uh, would welcome any of you to come and visit us here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, wonderful. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Lovely pictures of Abu Dhabi there. It looks like a nice new hospital. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, Dr. Goenka, uh, Chris, uh, if you have any questions, we could... Uh... Yeah, um, I think, Michael, I must uh, thank you for making this difficult subject so easy and so educative for everybody who is hooked in. Uh, I'm also happy that you are closer to India now than you were earlier. Uh, so we can fly, fly to you very soon if you feel like. So uh, Michael, a few questions and a few uh, comments. Uh, one is that you touched upon mainly the colonic polyp area, but there are questions on the chat box as well as my own question of some of the other difficult areas like Barrett's and um, indeterminate biliary strictures. Where do we stand of AI in these two areas is one question. Now I'm also interested to understand the uh, mechanism of unsupervised uh, deep learning. How does it work? Uh, we understand that you feed some information to a computer that how a cat will look like and how a dog will look like, but what is unsupervised learning? And I would also want a clarification from you about what is a convoluted network which you mentioned during your talk uh, compared to the rest of the rest of the techno technical terms which you used. So first of all, in terms of the other applications, essentially everything that we look at through an endoscope is now being subjected to AI research studies. So um, Barrett's early squamous cancer, early stomach cancer, even H. pylori associated gastritis, uh, indeterminate bile duct strictures, um, colitis, uh, colitis associated neoplasia, everything that we have a classification for, everything that we're trying to detect through an endoscope is now under study by, by AI. Uh, the most obvious ones are the ones uh, you, you mentioned. So there's robust data now on Barrett's um, AI systems, uh, particularly out of the Dutch Amsterdam group uh, from Jacques Bergman. Uh, but we have also very strong data now on early gastric cancer. And we have emerging data on bile duct strictures using uh, cholangioscopes, spyglass type systems. Um, so really anything that we have an image can be applied to this. The, the easiest ones are where we have a good gold standard. So that's why polyps were the first one out of the box because we remove them, the pathologist tells us what it is. We've got hundreds of thousands of images. And so it's relatively straightforward from a technical standpoint of view to train those algorithms. Um, obviously more challenging in an indeterminate bile duct stricture because Often we don't know what that is until some later date when it progresses to cancer. Um, in terms of uh, 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 the difference uh, between convolution, well, let me add, so uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. So first of all, um, you probably have used some sort of a facial recognition application. If you use uh, a social media app or uh, Google Photos, you probably start to label a few pictures of yourself and your friends I'd ask you to, to put a name on a face. So that's labeling. Once you label a few of those, it very rapidly recognizes a whole range. So in my Google Photos app, I might label my, my wife or my kids on five pictures, but then it can look at all 5,000 pictures that I have and figure out the rest of them using so-called unsupervised learning. So we do st still typically start with supervised learning where we annotate those pictures. We label a polyp as an adenoma. Uh, we do enough of those where it learns the algorithm and then it can continue to refine and improve that through unsupervised learning. But you're right, starting with unsupervised learning is, is more challenging. The, the beauty of unsupervised learning is 
if you think about you know, the process of labeling all these colon polyps, to really train an algorithm well, you might need 5,000, 10,000 pictures. So you've got to train somebody to label those. If you can limit that to maybe you know, five or 10 or 50 pictures and then do the rest of it unsupervised, it just makes the process of training the algorithms much, much more efficient, especially when you're talking about colon videos where you've got 30 frames per second, you know, to get somebody to label every one of those frames that has a polyp on it is a daunting task. Your final question, I'm not sure I have a great answer to. I am, I'm an endoscopist, I'm a medical doctor, I am not an engineer, I'm not a software guru. So to tell you the main difference between a convolutional neural network or a deep learning network, uh, I am, uh, that's why I, the, the smartest thing I ever do in my life is to find people that are around me that are smarter. Um, because they're the ones, I, I go find computer scientists and, and engineers to help me with those problems so that, because I, I'm not smart enough to know the difference between those two. Okay, great. Michael, uh, look, looking at uh, one of the other questions, there, there is a, a question, uh, you know, if I have to develop a new, if I wanted to develop an AI tool for a new indication endoscopy, who can I go to? Uh, who's available for collaboration? Is there a place that we can look or uh, maybe a resource that, uh, you know, that, that you might turn to for this? Yeah, so the best places tend to be your university computer science departments. Um, so many groups, um, uh, it, well, first of all, I, I should say at the commercial side. So, you know, as you know, much of the research we do as endoscopists is in partnership with the endoscope companies and all the endoscope companies are developing these tools. So a very easy place to start is your, whoever your partner is with, with an endoscope company. If you wanna develop new tools, um, the typical best place to start is a computer science department at your university. Many, many computer science departments are now working in this field and likely have a large AI research group within a university-based uh, uh, system. Um, so that's how I got started about four or five years ago. I went to a seminar at, at uh, uh, our, one of our local universities in Florida and met uh, Dr. Bagsy, and this is what he did. He classified uh, nodules on chest CTs, and I said, "How you know? can you help me classify polyps? and pancreas uh, cysts. And it is actually a pretty quick change or pretty easy change to go from lung nodules to cysts in the pancreas. Um, this area is very hot right now. Uh, actually, the biggest challenge is that the university-based systems uh, have a hard time competing for commercial systems. Every time I train a graduate student to help me with a pancreas, they get offered a salary 10 times more by Netflix to classify, you know, frames of a movie um, and find where, you know, such and such actress appears in, in, a, in a movie uh, script. So that, that's our biggest challenge is the, the true commercial industry, the non-medical is moving, uh, is much more, uh, much better funded than the medical um, uh, uh, AI systems. Michael, I have a question and um, to you is that we started using it only very recently and I find while the detection mode works particularly fine, when you talk about characterization, we find sometimes a technical problem of focusing on a small poly. So you need to zoom them and then uh, instill a dye to get a endocytoscopy and by the time you focus it, the poly may be out of your, your, your view. So do you think this is only a learning curve which is creating the problem or do you think it's an actual problem for an expert as well? And my second comment is that, do you think with the development of artificial intelligence, there'll be a clouding between a modest and an expert? Yeah, so the first uh, issue in terms of the systems for uh, computer-aided diagnosis. So these are just starting to come out uh, um, in terms of commercial application. In fact, in the US, they're not yet approved for, for diagnosis. They're approved for detection. Um, and the reason for that is the, 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 the threshold that uh, regulatory agencies are looking for is a much higher threshold because the implication is much, much greater. If, you, if the system tells you it's a benign hyperplastic polyp and you leave it alone, then it's wrong. Um, the, the implication of that is, is worse uh, uh, than if it um, 
uh, if it mislabels a, a bubble as a polyp, because you'll almost immediately recognize that it's just a bubble. Um, in terms of how these systems will actually work, you're right that the job of the endoscopist, we have to put the polyp on the screen. This is not going to look behind folds for us. It's not going to wash stool off for us. We still have to be good endoscopists. We still have to have the polyp on the screen and a good image of it. So uh, even from far away, you know, although that one example I showed you of a polyp amidst the bubbles, it detected. But in the end of the day, we've got to do what we've got to do our job, expose it well, clean it well, get the best quality image, and then let the, uh, the, the CAD X system um, do the rest. Um, it's not gonna turn a muddy stool colored polyp into a, a beautiful picture and tell you what it is. Um, yeah, I think, I, um, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Sorry, uh, you know, uh, just going to one of the questions that was asked also, um, Actually, uh, virtually everything that we've talked about, I think everything we've talked about so far is diagnosis, uh, you know, re refinements of diagnosis. But there's a question, uh, you know, will AI help to improve third space endoscopy? Do we have any applications for therapy or, or, or uh, treatment on, on the horizon? Um, so the, the obvious application would be uh, this constant dilemma about should we do an EMR or an ESD? So as you know, when you do an EMR and ESD, the critical thing you want to know is, is this a super, is it, is it a non-invasive polyp? Is it a soup where you might do an EMR? Is it a superficially invasive polyp where you might do an ESD? Or is it a deeply invasive polyp where you're going to send that polyp for surgery? So um, we are already seeing systems now that make that classification reasonably well. Um, and I think this will be important because it's going to directly lead to therapy. We know that even the JNET classification, when looked at by the, the founders of JNET, is only modestly accurate. Um, so I think we have lots of room for improvement there. So I think we can end this ongoing debate about should you do an EMR or an ESD if we had a very accurate system for mm -hmm. telling us uh, which one of these lesions is a you know, T1A cancer. In a sense, that's still diagnosis, isn't it? I mean. Uh, is there anything in the horizon where, you know, which, uh, let's say, makes use of uh, augmented reality and, and tells you, cut there, don't cut here because there's a vessel, uh, you know, or uh, maybe explore that area over there, uh, look at that a little bit better, uh, you know, when you're doing an ESD, let's say. Um, is, is, is there, I mean, yeah, so one such example, a system... Yeah, I think um, you can think about multiple areas of, of therapy. So, I mean, ultimately, when you're doing therapy, we're talking about, you know, resections. We're talking about drainage of fluid collections, um, uh, delivering stents. These are the kinds of therapeutic interventions. So, in my view, these are probably a little bit less likely to be, um, you know, directly impacted by AI. They're certainly indirectly imp uh, impacted by, uh, by AI because of the the how di a correct diagnosis leads to a correct therapy. One of the interesting things I've seen is augmented reality to help with, with um, ERCP. So when you're looking at a papilla, we all know that you're supposed to cannulate the bile duct up around the 11 o'clock position and the pancreas duct maybe around the one o'clock position. What if you could overlay a three-dimensional image from the MRCP um, and overlay that in an augmented reality on the papilla yeah. and know the exact approach and angle. Well, that's been done. So that's a nice example okay. of how it might assist you with bile duct cannulation or PD cannulation um, on an ERCP using augmented reality. So I think those kinds of systems are, are going to be very helpful. I think the other, you know, the, in, in the field of oncology, this is clearly going to be helpful as we get these complex genomic profiles of tumors and knowing what's the right chemotherapy to give based on the genomic profile. You know, the, the, the whole exome sequence is so complex, it's, it's difficult right now to translate that into a, what chemotherapy do I use um, or should I use chemotherapy at all? But we're seeing a lot of uh, progress in, in AI tools to help with that sort of big data question. How do we take the massive data we're getting from genome sequencing, from microbiome data and translate that into a therapy? 
Yeah. Uh, Michael, my question. Uh, yeah, Sora, can I, can I ask some? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, Michael, my question is that uh, what's the scope for retraining? Now, see, you are using a commercially available system and you find in a given case that it has misled you. Uh, you, you it, it detected a polyp, but it's not there. So is there any mechanism by which you can continuously train the computer that there is some fallacy? And can, the, can that improve the accuracy? Is there any, any way in which it can be done? Or we go with the inherent training which has been incorporated in the initial before it's commercialized? A great question. So um, th this comes down to sort of a regulatory question. So when um, fortunately, the regulatory agencies, for example, the Food and Drug Administration recognized that this first generation of AI systems is a first generation. And it, it required a huge amount of work, multiple randomized controlled trials to get to the point that they approved the first systems. We don't want to have to go through, you know, multiple randomized controlled trials every time there's a version, you know, 1.2 and 1.3. Um, to their credit, the Food and Drug Administration has said that they will allow iterative improvements. So they'll allow you to go from version 1.1 to 1.2 to 1.3, as long as you're trying to accomplish the same task, polyp detection. Um, and so they've actually written some guidelines. It's called the Computer or, or Software as Medical Device Guidelines. It's available on the FDA website. If you Google Software as Medical Device um, and, and FDA, it, you'll get a, a, a detailed document that says how they're going to approve those. But the bottom line is that will facilitate this iterative improvement. And you can imagine, um, you know, one of the goals, and I, I challenge the companies to be engaged with this, is if we can all network our colon colonoscopes, um, you know, we're all doing millions of colonoscopies a day across the world. We can very rapidly improve these systems if we can network and upload those videos for detection and classification. So I think that's really the next step now is we've gotten just out of the box with this first generation systems. We need to keep improving them. Yeah, and just uh, thank you. It was a great talk, by the way. Uh, so, you know, I, I mean, I recall reading the Nature paper. This is about four or five years ago as a, I think I was just a third year fellow. It seemed uh, incredible, like what can actually happen and what can be done with uh, this super powerful uh, AI. Now, I always wondered, in just a little off from endoscopy. So how uh, can we train uh, the computers to sort of, uh, think how we are thinking. So if a patient comes in front of me with X number of symptoms and uh, there's a certain pattern and we all as clinicians use our judgments to put recommendations and, uh, and diagnose patients. So can, is there, is there do, you think, do you think that can happen in future? I mean, of course, at this, you know, we, we are looking at AI being an assistant for us, just like endoscopy, but how about the clinical world? Yeah, I think that's sort of the, the we, we often imagine maybe in some movies uh, 20 years ago when, you know, for those of you that watched the IBM Watson win the, you know, chess competitions, win the Jeopardy game show competition, we thought that it was, the next step would be truly intelligent computers that you could talk to and say, you know, I've got stomach pain here and it, it uh, hurts when I swallow and and the computer would say, oh, well, you must have a reflux and here's your proton pump inhibitor. You know, it turns out that those problems are much harder to solve. And, and this is a, a little bit of a funny thing about this is artificial intelligence right now is pretty good at solving not very intelligent questions. Hmm. It, it's, it, it's good at solving, is this polyp an adenoma or hyperplastic? Is this picture of a colon, does it have a polyp, yes or no? Very simple questions. Is this mole a melanoma or a basal cell? Those are all pretty simple questions. Um, it has not yet solved the really complex questions. And, and honestly, that's good for us as doctors because otherwise people could just log on to their you know, Google Doc account and tell Google your history and it would tell you your diagnosis and your treatment algorithm. So yeah. I think uh, we still have a job uh, uh, for the next at least five or 10 years as doctors because that very complex thinking is still, uh, I would say, fairly beyond what AI systems are 
are, are capable uh, of solving. Um, you know, that's really diagnostic dilemmas. But the simple questions, here's a polyp in front of me. Um, what is it and what should I do about it? Um, those are very much uh, essentially achieved right now. Um, and we're starting to get into the little more complex tasks. Uh, for example, uh, one system can record you, can look at your video and say, and, and record your cecal intubation time. It recognizes the appendix. It recognizes the, the retroflexion in the rectum. It can even recognize what tool you're using. So if you see a polyp and it sees a forceps come out, it recognizes, oh, I did a forceps polypectomy versus a snare. And it will start to generate a report for you. It says, okay, mm -hmm. they found a five millimeter polyp and removed it with a snare. It's writing the report in the background. So we're still at a relatively sort of first grade level. Um, we're not yet at a university level of thinking um, for AI systems, but even that first grade level is going to help us with a lot of the, the simple mundane tasks we do as doctors that we really shouldn't be doing. We should be focusing on higher level thinking. Yeah. Now, and just a question on the panel. How easy is it when you did the research studies, how easy was it to get this algorithm done? So for instance, tomorrow, I just feel like, uh, you know, co collaborating with someone and, and saying, hey, these are my 500 IBD patient videos. And I want you to be able to, you know, uh, figure out if this patient has ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, you know, <laughs> say for example. Uh, how, how easy was it to train the computers and how much time did it take? Um, five years ago, that, that took us, a, um, you know, to, for example, that study in IPMN, uh, where we had a few hundred images. Our, our job as endoscopists and GI uh, physicians, we had to go find all those MRI scans. We had to make sure we had the right diagnosis. This was a IPMN with cancer or a low-grid IPMN. And we had to extract those images. So um, the most valuable contribution we can make is we need to get the images, make sure, you know, as I said, the, the, the first level is supervised learning uh, with labeled. So we need to label them correctly. And in an ideal world, we have lots of images that are well, uh, that have a good gold standard. So polyp pictures, Barrett's pictures, uh, MRIs of IPMN pictures. If you label them, the actual process of putting them through these algorithms is relatively straightforward, especially now, um, you know, we might spend uh, for 100 MRIs, you know, we might spend 500 hours getting those MRIs, labeling them, getting the right images, and we might spend 50 hours um, running them through these algorithms. Interesting. Right. And I think uh, there's some questions here as well. Dr. Vinita Ahuja is asking, does every scenario require deep neural networks or there are situations where applying machine learning may suffice and one may not be able to upgrade to deep neural networks? Yeah. Um, you know, most of these, is, um, most of these are gonna start out with the, the, the more simple um, uh, neural network systems uh, with labeled data. Um, so uh, you, you can start out, for example, you saw in our MRI study, we started out with only 60 uh, or on the pa missed pancreas cancer, we only had about 60 images or 60 cases, and we matched it with a couple of hundred controls. Mm -hmm. um, so those are pretty simple ways to start. Um, at that level, um, labeling all of those images is not very difficult. Where you really get into, you know, needing these unsupervised and deep learning algorithms is where you get into the massive data set. So, for example, second generation, these iterative improvements where we want, you know, 10,000 pictures of a polyp, 100,000 pictures of polyps. That's where you really need to get into these unlabeled uh, deep learning algorithms to, to really refine it. But the first step is still starting with labeled data. Yeah. I wonder if there will be a platform where someone will be able to just upload labeled images and, you know, and just contribute on a, at, a, at an international level. <laughs> anyway. So uh, they're, I, they're all, yeah. So, so those platforms uh, are very, Google, Google, uh, all of the major, you know, IT companies have online tools for this. It's still helpful to have a computer scientist. I, I, I must say, I could not do it myself. I, I have partners that, that are much more skilled at that than I am, but uh, those systems are, they're all cloud-based. So 
uh, you just upload them onto onto various cloud servers to do that task. So Michael, uh, we are trying to develop a, a training module for initial uh, program during fellowship where we are trying to find out the landmarks while you're doing the apogee endoscopy so that the trainee uh, at the end, we, we tell the trainee that you have missed out 30% of your stomach have not been examined or 20% has not been examined. Do you foresee, and this we have installed recently, so we are looking at how it works, but do you foresee the artificial intelligence being used for training our fellows uh, and to improve their skills of performing a complete endoscopy or a colonoscopy? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer to that is absolutely yes. So, you know, one of the beauties of these systems is that they work in real time. So, um, you know, for example, one system looks at, um, have you washed the colon well? Uh, and did you miss an area where it's maybe uh, behind a fold? So it, it recognizes folds and it recognizes, did you move back and look behind that fold? Similar to your issue, you know, did you uh, retroflex high in the fundus and look at the cardia uh, and fundus of the stomach? So those systems are coming. Uh, we've seen several manuscripts looking at that. So essentially that's sort of an immediate quality feedback. And, and that's the beauty of this is you can put that, instead of having you as an expert teach one fellow at a time, uh, if you have these systems available in your scope software, and immediately say, you know, this area is not washed well, you ought to wash it a little bit more, or you just passed a fold, you ought to go back and look behind that fold. That's something that you can put in any system. So I do think there's a huge potential for these as teaching tools, teaching aids. Okay. And, uh, you know, just a, a little on the side note, uh, what, what are your thoughts on natural language processing as we sift through these massive amounts of data to identify the patterns. How does that fit into AI or is it the same or is it a little different? Yeah, natural language processing is essentially looking at text and trying to extract data out of text. So um, it, it's a different uh, area than, than image or computer vision, but it's equally valuable. So a, a, a classic example is, can you train a system to calculate your adenoma detection rate? So if you think about what you need to calculate your ADR, you need a colonoscopy that says, I found the polyp, you know, what size and where it was. But you eventually need to connect that polyp to a pathology report, which is usually a text. I mean, mm -hmm. it might be coded, but it, not, it might just be free text. Most people just, most pathology departments just say, you know, five millimeter polyp consistent with adenoma. So the systems like that have, have trained natural language processing to look for the word adenoma and match it with your colonoscopy report that says three millimeter polyp in the sigmoid colon. And together that makes an adenoma detected and that makes your adenoma detection rate. So the, the natural language processing is quite valuable in that very practical sense um, of quality, uh, doing quality metrics. It's also very valuable from a research standpoint of view because you can start to do natural language processing of old text-based reports. You know, most of us for the last 30 years have been dictating reports. It's not structured data. It's not label data. You just have text. So if you can train an algorithm to go out there and let's say you wanted to find all of your IPMN cases and you, and this happens now, we, we just say, you know, search your entire electronic medical record for the word IPMN or you know, we used to call it mucinous ductal ectasia, and tell me the cases where that occurs. And you can write intelligent algorithms that say, you know, rule out the ones that say ruled out, you know, there is no IPMN or IPMN is ruled out. So you can exclude all those false positives. So natural language processing is a very valuable tool. It's also certainly enabled dictation. So now we, I can tell you when I write a manuscript now, I never type it, I dictate it. Yeah. And that's all natural language processing. Right. And I, I mean, I remember as a fellow, uh, we used to manually enter things in Excel with all the labeled data. And, uh, you know, anybody from the software industry would laugh at us uh, because uh, it's our systems have been so archaic. But yeah, certainly with NLP, I think it's promising. We'll take away the jobs of a lot of research assistants, I guess. <laughs> Right, thanks. Sort of you asked yeah. a question about clinical scenario and whether the yeah. computer will be able to go there. And Michael rightly uh, said that it's good that it's not happening at that speed. 
but it will ultimately happen. Possibly the, uh, this, there are advances on that. One thing which I'd like to uh, tell you is that we have been working on developing some of the scores using artificial intelligence. You know, all these FIP4 score, which is used for liver fibrosis. They've been developed primarily by using linear regression analysis. So if you feed the data into artificial intelligence system, then you, the results which come out may be more accurate than what uh, you get from um, the way in which some of these scores have been developed. And we developed a, a score for uh, liver fibrosis using uh, uh, machine learning. And it seems that this there may be an improvement in the scoring system as well. Uh, interesting. Well, that's great. A lot of active work in India as well. So it's good to see. I believe, uh, yeah, okay. Any more questions? I guess we could, uh, I think it's 9-11, so it's time we should wrap up. But uh, yeah, are we good? Any questions, uh, Dr. Kaur, Dr. Goenka? Any thoughts? I think we all really enjoyed the talk, Michael. Yeah, thank you. A okay. real pleasure Bye. to uh, be with you all in the whole audience tonight. Thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, congratulations on this very nice platform you've all, you've all developed. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for uh, being and sparing your Sunday evening. Actually, a working day for you, which I didn't realize initially. And thank you, Christopher, for uh, joining in so late. It's almost midnight in Singapore. So thank you for joining in. So nice of you. And talk to, uh, thank you, Dr. Goenka. I know you're extremely busy, but uh, for you, take out your Sunday evening for us and your valuable comments. We really appreciate it. So thank you so much. And uh, I thank uh, the Olympus team and uh, the Sun uh, for promoting this event and uh, helping uh, sponsor this event. So I think I can wrap up there uh, so everybody can have their dinner in India and Chris can go to sleep in <laughs> Singapore. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.